guest in studio today, Paul Rabel. Is the uh, founder of the PLL. Um, many consider. Thank you. Thank you all. One of the greatest lacrosse Great players. Here. One of the greatest lacrosse players of all time. That's a lot of people. The, the Michael Jordan, the LeBron. You've heard this so many times. It's all in your bio and things like that. You've heard that. But you've taken to a, a different path now as a author, as yeah. a writer of, of your own book. It's the, uh, the Way of the Champion. You were talking about it on the way in. I want everybody to hear it comes out May 7th, 2024. Tell me about the way of the champion. Uh, well, it's great to be here. Last time I was on Rich Eisen's show was in 2020 when, when the league, the PLL, was the first to announce our bubble solution to the pandemic. Yes. Which was huge <laughs> for an emerging sport to figure it out first because that allowed us to get booked on top shows like this to talk about what it was that we were interested in. Mm -hmm. And I think my, you know, my career whether it's an athlete or an entrepreneur or um, author now, creator, it's, it's, it's been underpinned in curiosity. I launched a podcast because I was told by a friend of mine, the conversations that I would have with other athletes like you, Kirk, or coaches like Bill Belichick, or entrepreneurs like Mark Cuban, they're like, have you thought about you know sharing that with the public? Right. And uh, that was the sort of lead into writing a book, which for me, I'm inspired by other stories. And that was a big part of my career and will continue to be a part of my career. The lessons that I learned from the best athletes, artists, and entrepreneurs in the world. And so I had this sort of thought to try to distill it mm -hmm. into three parts and call it the way of the champion. The three parts are amateur, professional, and beyond the game. Right. And when I walked in, as you said, I was like, damn, Kirk <laughs> is, you know, we could just sit here and I could actually, I feel like I should interview you oh, no. about your career going from <laughs> yeah. San Diego State to yeah. the NFL, then going back to San Diego State to call games. Right. And then that led to your career that's blossomed since. And you probably never had that thought that you were gonna be doing this right now, but your inspiration, was as authentic as I, I think we all hope to be, and then we see where life takes us. No, I always knew I wanted to do this. Always, you did. always. I just knew it. Beyond the mic, like beyond the. You already knew it. Like You're a I, I woke up when I was younger, and I watched Sports Center, and I would turn it down and thought I was a broadcaster. Oh, that's cool. So for, I think for you, you've been around lacrosse pretty much your whole life. Yeah, and you, the feeling that you had the first time you picked up your stick. Yeah and you went out there and played. Did you ever imagine like, you know what? I have to continue this and show people why this game is so great. What does it, what does it mean? What does it meant to you? That's been, uh, that's been the third part of my career. I, I found lacrosse when I was 12. My neighbor gave me his backup stick. I went out for the rec team because mm -hmm. I was playing basketball and soccer at a high level. And both of my coaches at that age wanted me to commit to AAU year round in right. club soccer. And I wanted to keep playing both. So I said no, and that gave me a third opportunity to play a new sport. I, I really sucked at it when I started. <laughs> it wasn't very good. It's a, it's a difficult <laughs> right. sport. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you know, I was with my nephew for Easter last weekend and or this past weekend and and just he the way he's able to kick a soccer ball and put a basketball on a net right. is so much more intuitive than picking up a lacrosse ball. Same thing in hockey and golf. They're just hand-eye coordination sports. They take a lot of work. So the first phase was was committing to that growth. The second was I was competitive as hell. Mm -hmm. And that took me through high school, college, and the early stages of pro. And then I learned about the game and its history. It's the oldest sport in North America. It's a Native American game. And frankly, it was at a time too where you know, Coach Belichick was generous enough to do the forward of this book. And him and I had built a strong relationship going back to my early 20s. And yeah. we talked about going out and playing for the Patriots. <laughs> and he wanted me to be a strong safety. I wanted to play in the slot. Really? So that was a, that was a disagreement. Um, and I committed to lacrosse. And I think yeah. it was at that point where I was like, all right, I got to do something more with this than just play. You know what? When, when you train for baseball, you go to have a hitting instructor. You go hit baseball. Yeah. So you go throw. Um, basketball, you go just go shoot shots, yeah. right? Football, you go do some gassers and you yeah, do yeah. some football drills. Has anyone asked you, how do you train for lacrosse? What is the training regimen? Yeah. Because I feel like 
it's a lot of sports wrapped up in one. You have to have the hand-eye coordination. You got to have the conditioning, yeah. right? You have to have some of the stamina that you need, like in a soccer game. But yeah. you also have to have the physicality of the football aspect of it as well. How do you train for lacrosse? Well, I think the first thing is your stick skills. So your your ability to handle the ball really, right. really well. It's like a point guard in hoops, right? I mean, what makes Chris Paul and Steve Nash so perennial right. is that it's not that other point guards don't see the floor as well as they do, but they have the ball dribbling in a half motion in their left <laughs> hand. They see someone open there and mm-hmm. get it off their hip right. accurately. Same thing with Rajon Rondo in his time, right? Like, boom. Over so there, you, yeah. if you see something and are able to hit it faster than anyone else, that's the importance of your skill work. So what lacrosse players do is they find a wall, they get against the wall, and they just pass. Just repetition, repetition. And then you're right. Like, you know, the athleticism has evolved in the type of athlete that are playing the game. You have to be in the gym. You have to be well-conditioned. You have to be strong. Uh, you have to work on your mindset. Right, like you know this more than anyone in the NFL. It's mostly about your headspace because mm-hmm. everyone is a great athlete and everyone, you know, uh, has a resume. But who has it upstairs? Like the Tom Brady esque mindset leads to an elongated career. So it's it's all of that. He's Paul Rabel. He's the uh, author of the Way of the Champion, uh, the founder of the PLL. Uh, premier lacrosse league. You know, Paul, I know sometimes you 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 met some of the, the great athletes to play different sports. And when you think about what drives them, and you, in, in your book, The Way of the Champion, yeah. you find different ways that push guys, that the the per, the determination, the will. Yeah. When you meet certain people, what do you ask of them? What do you, what do you ask in terms of what drives them? What pushes them? How do you incorporate it in what you've been able to do? I, I try to ask them what their relationship is with winning and losing mm. and how they handle failure. You know, a lot of times we sit with athletes or any successful leader in any industry and ask them about their successes. It's really hard to talk about where you screwed up and the mistakes you've made. A lot of people aren't willing to go there. Mm. But the truth is the greats lose a lot. Bill Belichick is the second most losingest coach in NFL history, (laughs) and he has eight Super Bowls. Cy Young blew the most saves. Marty Brodeur gave up the most goals in the NHL, right? Mm -hmm. Metallica had flops. Vincent Van Gogh (laughs) never sold a painting while he was alive. Like The idea that the best just win all the time, it's actually the opposite they can endure loss better than most. And they have this level of resilience. Mm. And so I think, you know, understanding that was part of how I approached this book. And then, you know, look, here's the thing, there's no blueprint for winning. It's it's different for most athletes. And I'll give you an example. The two greatest footballers of all time are Pele and Tom Brady. And Pele won three World Cups, Tom Brady seven Super Bowls. Mm. Before a match, Pele would lay on his bench, put a cold towel over his eyes, meditate. And he would think, try to lower his heart rate and think about being skillful with the ball on his foot. Tom Brady used anger. He (laughs) wanted to be pissed off. (laughs) He wanted, he believed that that heightened sense of emotion was going to help him execute. Two polar opposites, two of the best ever. So it's, it's sort of like finding your way based on others' experiences. And then, but you have a love for the game too, though. Yeah. Oh, you have to. If you don't, if you don't have a passion, like I listened to Wayne Gretzky talk about practice. He was like, "I didn't practice. Mm. I didn't practice. Right. I loved playing hockey so much. It was what I wanted to do. If you're an athlete out there that's being told you have to get extra shots up or get against the wall, you're not going to hit the level of potential that might be destined for someone else that is in love with what they do." And, and I tell young kids that today, too. If, if, if your coach is out there making sure that you're hitting the wall after practice and right. spending extra time, it's, it's probably not going to be a thing. When you see athletes doing it on their own, that's when you realize they have something. You know, one thing I've always asked authors when they're writing a book, you sit back and you kind of open up old memories yeah. because you're trying to jog down like, oh, I remember that moment. And you start to relive those moments. Was, was there a moment in writing this that comes back to mind, whether it was high school, college, 
in your pro career or even in your career after yeah. retiring? Was there a moment in writing this book that you says, man, I can't believe I actually accomplished that? Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's been a few times I, where I've stopped and thought to myself, wow, even if you're not looking to publish something, writing, sitting right. down, being quiet and writing about you know, what you're going through and what others have experienced yeah. is a very conscious uh, practice. And with that consciousness, you're able to pick up on things that you would have otherwise not noticed. So to your point, it was a, it's an astute comment, is that when I looked at the history of the greats losing a lot, I looked at myself as like, man, I've had some really bad seasons. <laughs> and I've it. lost championship games. Yeah. I've been, you know, down in the gutter with my play. And if you look back at those moments, usually the following season, I had my best. Right. And it's sort of like back against the wall um, and testing yourself and, and seeing what you can come up with. So th those were probably some of the, my personal experiences that I was able to pair with a lot of these greats. You know, for me... I played in the NFL for, for eight years. Yeah. I had six head coaches. Wow. I never had a winning season. Came close. I came was like eight and eight. Yeah. So there's emotions that you draw in there of why do I play this game? Mm -hmm. What is the passion? Because there's always that tunnel and you know what's at the end of that tunnel because you see the light. Where's a championship, a division, whatever it may be. I always saw the light. I just never got to it. So what drove me? What I had to find ways to drive me. And yeah. You mentioned... Bill Belichick, who's right. been very, definitely influential f to you. He wrote a forward in, in your book. Um, your relationship with him and in just talking sports in general, we think about football, but I think he's also one of the great minds of just sports yeah. and competition and how to dig deeper than just the analytics or the X's and O's. Yeah, I mean, I think I was lined up with other NFL GMs trying to get Coach Belichick to come over and coach in the PLL. <laughs> yeah, um, let's break some news, Paul. So yeah. Have you reached out? Is he going to join yeah, what you is well, I've definitely, I've definitely reached out. Um, really? And if he was going to join us, you guys would have heard. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I think he would be a phenomenal coach in our league. He grew up playing lacrosse, so right. he's obsessed with it. That, that's why we sort of connect. He keeps sticks in his office. And he's just an analytical mind. My, I, I feel for you, six coaches in eight seasons is really hard. Yeah. You know, the number one reason why kids stop playing sports is they're not having fun, and that's tied directly mm -hmm. to the coach. That by chance, yeah. their local rec team has put into place. Right. And so I've been really fortunate to have great coaches. You know, and... I study the Nick Sabans of the world and the Greg Popoviches, the Steve Kerrs, the Bill Belichicks. My coach, Dave Petromalo, was fantastic. And, and you're able to sort of think through the relationship that coaches have, like the love-hate, right. the player-coach. And that's so critical. I mean, it's really hard. My brother uh, was a captain at Dartmouth for mm -hmm. their football team. And this was... He graduated in 2006, so right before the Buddy Tevens era took off and Dartmouth started really winning Ivies, and he had four losing seasons. Yeah. And it was just a grind, as he describes. But as what we learn in life, uh, both ends of the spectrum are just as valuable. Winning, losing, success, failure, and where you don't really want to be is, I think, like somewhere caught in the middle. Uh -huh. So I'm sure what you learned from those six different coaches in those seasons have given you this level of strength that you have today. Yeah, it's he's the author of The Way of the Champion. Pain, persistence, and the path forward. Yeah. The path forward for you. Um, in retiring, yeah. going away from the game, and now being the entrepreneur part of it, being yeah. the owner of what's that next passion for you when you wake up in the morning? What is that passion? Because as a player, it was always easy. You woke up, I know what I needed. Gonna have me a smoothie, protein shake, whatever. You knew what that path was. You knew what, what you needed to do that day. What is that path now for you? What is that wake up drive for you now 
when it comes to lacrosse. Well, there's the business side and the personal and side. side. Right. On the personal side, I don't know about you, but I, I try to keep the same routine. Mm. Of even when I was a person, so I have a lemon water, then a celery juice, and then I'll have a protein shake and some coffee and get out the door. Gotcha. Because I think starting the day or owning the morning is really important. Um, but when we set out to, I call it rebuild professional lacrosse, because I had played in major league lacrosse for right. 11 years, and then we started the PLL. Um, is it we're rebuilding a sport, we're rebranding a sport, uh, a sport that was once in the Olympics. I had said it's the oldest game in North America. It had had a professional game. It's been playing in college since the late 1800s. Um, this is a game that has, as, as Mark Cuban would say, as an <laughs> investor, product market fit. Mm -hmm. So what went wrong? So we try to address that. And when we launched the PLL, we wanted to do what the UFC and MLS had done in North America in half the amount of time. Right. Just break through and be a top five sports league. And we had a number of strategies as what as why we could do that. But that's my that's my day to day mindset. And that is I think running in parallel to when I was an athlete. Is that every day I was like, how do we win? How do we set ourselves up for the playoffs and championship? And what are we gonna do? I mean, I was backstage in the green room and mm -hmm. and uh Took a leak before, and there's uh, Bill Belichick, do, do your, your job. Do your job. Do your job. Oh, yeah. I love that. I, I wanted to ask, you know, is that like do the job there? Or right. is, I know this is a big uh, Bill Belichick group. Mike, do your job. It's, yeah. It's everything. Yeah, it's everything. Yeah. I did my job in there. Good job. Man. I did my job. But it was a good reminder. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, doing the job is also, you Wash know, wiping hands. down the seat if you need to. Exactly. Yep. Washing your hands. I'm trying to tell my my uh, my boys that right now, little boy, wash you know, under ten. Oh, wash your hands, but hey, yeah. do your job in the toilet, yeah. not out the toilet, right? That just gives you more work. But <laughs> <That's it. laughs> you know, Paul, um, when when I just think about your story in general, and it's still ongoing, and still, you know, being able to keep being innovative, yeah, in, in a sport in which you care so much about, like you're yeah. so uh, the passion that you have about the sport. So when you're able to go talk to young kids what do you tell them what, what is your message to the up-and-coming lacrosse the next generation of lacrosse players who have i would say now more brands yeah. more ways more visibility than maybe when you first started totally. there was no instagram and twitter's no social media and now brands that get people excited to watch lacrosse what would you tell the young athletes now who are coming up in lacrosse the future is bright you know they're they're going to be playing in a league that pays them a million dollars to play at some point. Wow. You know, that that's going to be, that's part of my brother and my collective goal is to get player wages on par yeah. with the greats that are competing in the traditional leagues. And I'd mentioned once being in the Olympics right. last year, we announced we got back in the Olympics. So LA 28, you'll see lacrosse. And Perfect. if you're a 14 year old, <laughs> yeah, if you're a 14 year old, all of a sudden you're going, damn, I might be in the Olympics. So this sport is at a level that's on par with the, the traditional leagues at the moment. And it, and it wasn't when I was playing. So I, I think that sort of aspirational goal, why young kids pick up a basketball or a football and kick a soccer ball is they know that there's an afterlife. So we've created that afterlife. That's really important. And the other point, I was listening to the earlier segment you guys were having around talking about baseball and, right. and other tweaks. And I, I listened to Larry David here a few weeks ago, or maybe it was a, a couple weeks ago, talking about uh, the UFL and getting rid of the goalposts. Um, he hates goalposts. Hates, goal hates goalposts. He hates it. Yeah. I kind of get it. I, I bought it. <laughs> I, you know, I bought it. I mean, it would be a different game if you just touch down or, or get out. Yeah. You no know? But, so we, but we look at our sport and have the ability to, as owners of the league, mm -hmm. to jurisdict and make it more digestible. Because like hockey's challenge in the 90s, it's difficult to track the puck, the blue line to blue line off sides is complicated for fans. You know, So we've thought about ways to simplify the rules uh, to make them more understandable. And uh, we think about our term length each season and the way the playoffs are set. We just put our eight teams into home cities. We have an Eastern and Western conference. So things that are universally understood, that's, that's the stuff that I think about all the time, right? Making this game more accessible, making it more uh, digestible, 
um, and having more people talk about it. Well, it's also just expansion and exposure. I mean, right. look, you're from Maryland. Yeah. You went to Hopkins. Yeah. Mm -hmm. People think about lacrosse 20, 30 years ago. It's only a mid-Atlantic sport. Totally. I, went, I went to Syracuse, been a lacrosse powerhouse forever with the Gate brothers and the Powell brothers. How have you really gone about trying to get it global? global. Yeah. Well, you have to manufacture it. Mm -hmm. So we put our headquarters in L.A. when we announced the league in 2018. Mm -hmm. People are like, why are you going to L.A.? Well, somebody's got to do it right. if we want to migrate this sport west. Yeah. You know, and there have been a lot of leaders that have done it in lacrosse over time, just, you know, brick by brick, starting programs out in L.A., starting programs in the Midwest, in the Southeast, in the Pacific Northwest. But it's incumbent on leadership in any sport to be the change. And now there's 91 countries that are playing lacrosse up from 18 when I first started watching it in the late 90s. Um, we're back into the Olympics as, I, as we had just talked about. But I think we, we have to drive as a league an investment to get more sticks in hands, more goals on field. I mean, I think, I think about why I grew up playing hoops is there was a basketball court in every neighborhood. Right. You know, all you needed was a ball. You know, it's, it's actually been the OG move of football in America is that they went the local municipality route of funding equipment such that we could get our helmets and shoulder pads for free when we played peewee football right without that football is just as expensive as lacrosse hockey and golf oh yeah mm -hmm. but they went the subsidizing route which was brilliant right and then they invested in coaches because if you take a sport like lacrosse and look talking about my nephew hard to play if you don't have a good coach you're going to quit because you're not having fun you're not skilled enough so you got to not only be out here, but we got to educate coaches. Last question for you, Paul, before I got to let you run. But the way of the champion, the book, Path Persistence and the Path Forward. Um, the one thing that I would say is that you've had this illustrious career, whether it's playing lacrosse, now being an owner, and now, I mean, now being a founder. But I also see one thing. The one thing that I see now is that you will continue to prophesize and tell people about lacrosse. Yeah. But then the next part is that you've done films, you've done podcasts, you've done the book now. And I love movies. So people are watch a movie and we'll have five different takes. You saw the movie, you I like one that. part, I'll have one take. But for you, what do you want people in reading The Way of the Champion? What would you hope that they take away from this book? Literally that. You know, is that one chapter speaks to them. You know, my, my favorite book is called Meditations by Marcus Aurelius, same format. Rick Rubin wrote a similar format for the creative act, which is one page chapters that are lessons or thoughts or, uh, you know, provocative notes to motivate, to mm -hmm. inspire. And because of the range that different athletes and entertainers and entrepreneurs have taken, that one chapter or more that speaks to someone hopefully is both utilitarian, uh, entertaining, and something that they bookmark and revisit. You know, this book is essentially an amalgamation of two dozen journals that I've kept mm -hmm. over my career. And, um, I think that's the best thing we can do as athletes or creatives is just put our best work out there, not be outcome focused, mm -hmm. right? And that allows you to be who you are, which in the end is just what we're hoping to put out there in this world. The way of the champion, pain, persistence, and the path forward by Paul Ray. Well, coming out May 7th, May 7th, 2024. Make sure you go grab a copy of this. Paul, I appreciate um, your time. Paul Rabel, everybody, the owner of the, or the founder of the PLL. And also now I got to copyright that, Own the Morning. I'm going to start telling my kids. Yeah, own the hey, morning, let's man. Own the Morning, everybody. Let's go. Wake up. Wake up. That's own right. the Morning. That's right, man. Own the Morning. Get up. Make that bed up. That's it. That's it. And the best way to own the morning is get some good sleep. There it is. LeBron James <laughs> sleeps more than most. Here we go. That's that fountain of youth. <laughs> Paul, man, I appreciate the time. Appreciate it. Catch the Rich Eisen Show every single day on the Roku channel, 12 to 3 Eastern, for free.